Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 5983 in the name of Martin Whitfield on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on Future Parliamentary Procedures and Practices. I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Martin Whitfield on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee to open the debate uh, around nine minutes please Mr Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is a pleasure to open this, our second committee debate, into the future parliamentary procedures and practices of this, both our chamber, but also our, also our institution. And I move the motion in my name on behalf of the Standards, Procedure and Public Appointments Committee. Can I thank the committee members, both those present, those recent, and those less recent, for all of their work in respect of this report and it's a great pleasure to see so many familiar faces around the chamber today and I look forward to their contributions coming on. I would also like to thank the clerks both present and recently past for their efforts and work um, in the preparation of this report but most of all I would like to thank those members who are here today. The report was published on the 6th of July, a, a mere 41 pages, a small trivial report by committee standards, a mere 207 paragraphs. So I hope the same has been well digested, well thought through, and indeed people have come today with questions. One of the lessons of the pandemic is that change should not be shied away from. The ways in which the people of Scotland work and engage has changed profoundly since the beginning of 2020. And this Parliament would be out of step with those changes if it reverted to its previous practices. It is important in the Committee's view to be mindful of the kind of institution this Parliament will want to be in 10 years' time, not just in the next six months, two years or shorter. Evidence has been gathered from members here across this chamber, from parliaments and fellow parliamentarians across the United Kingdom, including our own youth parliament, and indeed much wider. We have spoken with experts in democracy and change, and we have spoken to those who speak, of those who are challenged at the moment to engage with this parliament because of geography, because of disability, or reasons of feeling excluded. Daniel Ooh, Johnson. I'm very thankful to my friend uh, for, for giving way. I was, indeed, I was struck by the contributions in the report reflecting on the importance of face-to-face -face, uh, discourse and debate. I wondered if some of those comments uh, might actually lead on to future work from his committee about how actually we can maximise face-to-face discourse as that is clearly a core role of this parliament. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for, for that intervention. And indeed, um, almost in anticipation, my speech will come to that. Um, but can I just also formally put on the record my thanks to everyone who contributed their evidence, evidence to this report. Stephen Kerr. He says that much has changed because of the pandemic, and of course we all accept that. Um, but some things shouldn't be scrapped, they shouldn't be changed. For example, we have this bill that we're going to put through this place in a matter of a few hours with minimal scrutiny, the Cost of Living Protection of Tenants Scotland Bill, this is a complete coach and horses through any kind of scrutiny that this Parliament can give. Does he agree? Mar Martin Whitfield. To anticipate the scrutiny of bill that will arrive next week, I think, is probably slightly perfunctory for me at this stage, in all honesty. And as I stand here as convener, however, on the question, on the question of how the government is overviewed by this chamber, I will make comment later. And I'm very grateful to the two interventions because I was going to give a slight signposting for people so that they could slip in for their own social media their interventions in the areas that I'm going to cover. Principally, I would like to look at the hybrid nature of this chamber, but also the hybrid nature of our committees. And finally, I was going to raise the question of proxy voting. So you have your headlines, wait, bear, or indeed leap up to intervene if I haven't covered something that you would like me to. Regarding the hybrid debate in this chamber, evidence presented shows that the Scottish Parliament did great work to ensure that members were enabled to speak, to ask questions and to vote. However, by enabling, and this to answer the most recent intervention, does not mean the same as prior to hybrid. And we did recognise that there has been a challenge in conducting scrutiny using the hybrid method. The committee notes that in comparison, however, with other legislatures, we introduced more measures to ensure that its members were able to participate in parliamentary business.
that all types of parliamentary business in fact continued and that all MSPs were able to vote. This has been an important achievement and it should be acknowledged, thanked for, but it should also endure. The conclusions and recommendations in this report confirm that the continuation of hybrid meetings and provide for and enable iterative change in the future is important. Rather than return fully to the previous practices, the committee considers that there is potential to build on a gradual, progressive change as technology improves that can bring the Parliament closer to the people of Scotland in accordance with those key principles that underpinned the work of setting up the Parliament since 1999. On the point of voting, it was at times cumbersome and we have to recognise that. However, it is extremely important in allowing every member to vote on every occasion. And indeed, the statistics show that the level of voting matched prior to the pandemic, during the pandemic, and post our return, which, although some consider still cumbersome, is proof indeed that people have been, been able to exercise their democratic right for the reason that they were sent to this place. The committee very much welcomes the specific plans to introduce the new platform for hybrid meetings and, as indicated earlier, considers this will help improve the ability of members to debate by allowing interventions to be made or taken by both members in the chamber and also those participating remotely. This committee believes and indeed heard a substantial amount of evidence that the Parliament is currently its most effective when its members come to Holyrood to represent their constituents and participate in person in the Chamber. However, we also recognise from evidence that there are a number of circumstances in which members should have the option to participate remotely. These circumstances may include situations in which illness, bereavement, caring commitments, travel, weather disruption, who can imagine that here in Scotland, or indeed personal commitments inhibit their ability to come to Parliament. However, the committee heard very strong arguments for requiring ministers to always be present in person in Parliament. The committee agrees that this is important for scrutiny and calls on the Scottish Government to ensure that ministers are present, apart from exceptional circumstances while they are being scrutinised by this Parliament. There is a further reason for continuing the hybrid arrangement as a means of encouraging a more diverse range of people to stand for election. In Parliament. It will provide the Parliament with the flexibility in the future to offer alternative means of participating in parliamentary business rather than requiring elected members to fit into an established method of working, notwithstanding their own personal circumstances. More than happy to. Emma Roddick. Um, I appreciate the points he's making around um, better representation in the Chamber, but considering that the exception will be ministers, does he realise that this will create an unattainability of being a minister for those who are disabled or face other challenges? Martin I, Whitfield. I am indeed very grateful, very grateful for that intervention, and it does raise a really extremely important position about how is it that every person who wishes to seek election here can move through the system up in, should you wish it, the grandeur heights of government. And it is a point of scrutiny and review, and it's why the report and the committee talk about iteration, slow movements of change to confront the problems that are in front of us, and indeed for the system to be flexible enough to allow for that. So absolutely I understand um, what the member raises by, by way of the intervention. But our report and supporting our report, I would suggest, does not prevent that iteration occurring as we're confronted with it. And we indeed need the flexibility to be able to do that. So thank you. Um, I am conscious of time. Uh, so on committees, let me just say we feel very much the same. They need to remain in hybrid. There needs to be a responsibility on our members to be present um, at committee meetings. And indeed, there are different committees in this uh, ac across this Parliament with different remits. And so it's important that each committee remains the flex retains the flexibility that hybrid gives. But most importantly, for committee's point of view, I'm slightly conscious of time, but I'm... Uh, briefly, Mr. Mountain. Um, I wondered, uh, com as the convener of the committee that I was on as well, is whether you've, we've considered fully enough how members who are t attending virtual committee meetings and are getting classified papers 
should get those when it's not possible to send them out in advance by email under the current party's, uh, parliamentary system. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful indeed for that intervention. And indeed, within the report, the conveners group have asked for guidance um, on how to deal with a variety of matters within committee. I think some conveners sought that to support their right to say, please, can you come and be here? Other, con other conveners sought that advice to give them evidence to say, this is how we want uh, matters to be dealt with. And I envisage, having uh, witnessed challenges with regard to papers, that that is one of the areas that is addressed. I am now desperately conscious of time, so I'm going to seek the Chamber's indulgence just to raise the question of proxy voting. Because following consultation, the committee will propose a temporary rule change which will provide for a scheme that will permit members in certain defined circumstances, including parental leave and long-term illness, to nominate a proxy. Such a, such a scheme, we believe, should be allowed to run for a period of 12 months or so and monitored during that time before we re-evaluate the system for any permanent rule changes. My lovely poetic platitudes that was going to go on and explain about the wonders and the need for proxy voting, I will put to one side, Deputy Presiding Officer. So let me conclude. The committee, during the course of this inquiry, said it's thinking about what the Parliament should look like in 10 years' time. We believe that this Parliament should commit to a culture of iterative change, to allow it to be more representative, to allow it to be more open, and allow it to be more accessible in 10 years' time. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. And I now call on George Adam to open on behalf of the Scottish Government. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, thank you for the conveners uh, opening there for this debate. Presiding Officer, I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate on behalf of the Scottish Government. Whilst instances of a national emergency are never welcome, they do necessitate real-life action during what is inherently challenging circumstances for all concerned. And it is vital that this Parliament maintains not only its scrutiny function, but is equipped and available to pass any emergency legislation required to protect the public interest. The Scottish public, quite rightly, look to both Government and Parliament to protect these interests and even more so during times of trouble, and to do so swiftly, flexibly and effectively. Stephen Kerr. Well, the Minister very sincerely believes this Parliament should fulfil its scrutiny function, as he just mentioned. But how on earth is that the case in relation to the Cost of Living Protection of Tenants Scotland Bill? I mean, this is a complete coach and horses to the conventions and procedures of this place. Minister. Mr Kerr is never one to labour a point uh, of a point of uh, phrase. I think, as others have said during uh, this debate earlier on, let's wait to see what's in front of us and we can take it from there as well. But it is important that this emergency legislation goes through because we're talking about real people and real life issues in this scenario. So, moving on, presiding officer, although the pandemic led to a steep learning curve for all, and presented us all many challenges. The operational adaptions the Parliament has subsequently developed and adopted have proven essential towards maintaining the good governance of Scotland. And I thank everyone in the Parliament for the close working uh, partnership we have enjoyed during that period. That partnership has helped us during COVID and will no doubt be important in helping respond quickly and flexib uh, flexibly to all future challenges. The finding in the committee's report that despite recent events the Parliament was able to fulfil its scrutiny function was especially welcomed by the Scottish Government, a principle around which the Government has worked constructively with Parliament to ensure. At this point, presiding officer, uh, I would like to concentrate on the committee's report itself. And the Government welcomes the finding of the committee's uh, recent inquiry into virtual and hybrid procedures. And the recognition that the committee's report that working practices of all Scots have changed is well observed by us. The overarching principle that the Parliament should maintain the flexibility of arrangements to enable hybrid and virtual proceedings is very much supported by the Scottish Government. These new ways of working were born out of necessity. Uh, many, uh, many of those that gave evidence on the committee noted the opportunities that arise for increasing participation in proceedings and for Parliament to engage generally with the public. Those aims have been featured strongly in terms of governance principles that we aspire to in Scotland, and the committee's report shines a light on the possibilities that might develop for increased flexibility in our business methods. Business has clearly had to adapt under hybrid or virtual circumstances, but the continuity of Parliament's ability to function and act is paramount. 
I remember, presiding officer, the Parliamentary Bureau in the early days when I was Chief Whip, when we first uh, dealt with this challenge, and we effectively moved for having absolutely nothing in place to a system that may have been clunky at times, but was functional, and Parliament was still able to commit to its duties. And I note the committee's findings concerning what action it considers that the Parliament should take to build upon and improve virtual and hybrid proceedings going forward. The Government stands ready to assist the Parliament in whatever measures it sees fit to pursue. One ongoing issue, and sometimes seen as a, thorn, a, a, a thorny one, is the attendance of Ministers in person in Parliament. Uh, I touched earlier on the committee's findings uh, that the Parliament was able to fulfil its scrutiny function despite recent events. The availability of ministers is clearly crucial to achieving that objective. The Government is aware uh, of its accountability to this Parliament and its membership. That responsibility applies wherever the prevailing circumstances, whatever the prevailing circumstances, and given the recent pressures, pressures we have all experienced. It is especially welcomed that the committee found that scrutiny had been fulfilled despite the impacts of the COVID pandemic. No problem. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful to the Minister to give way and indeed um, possibly to reflect that the Minister is a better position to give the Government's assurance with regard to people who um, are differently challenged to attend this Parliament. It would not prevent anyone succeeding in Government if their ability allowed them to do so simply because of their inability to attend in the way that was referred to earlier. Minister. Uh, coming from my own background with my wife, I have multiple sclerosis and me being a primary carer, although sometimes she wonders who cares after who, uh, I, I think uh, I come from a position where I would think it's always positive to ensure that people have the opportunity uh, to achieve all they can when they come to this place. Uh, and uh, just going back on to what we were talking about previously, it's a testament to the excellent partnership working between the government and the parliament that we managed to get ourselves into a place where we could continue. The default position, and this will be the important one for everyone in here, remains one of caution. However, ministers operate on the basis of physical attendance in the parliament wherever possible, consistent with the findings in the committee's report. That brings me to proxy voting, and it is for the Parliament to consider any, pro any proposals in relation to its operation, including any changes to its voting arrangements. The merits of a proxy voting scheme are clearly outlined in the Committee's report, as is the need to ensure that such arrangements are robust and fit for purpose. In my role as a member of the Bureau, I am aware of the, uh, that the Committee has already sought comments on some of the finer details of any such proposal. One key aspect could be the criteria for seeking a proxy and the period of time for which it is sought. Also, the definition of illness is not altogether straightforward. Clarity in that issue would be central to management of the scheme and evaluating its fairness. I'm, thank you, Daniel Jackson. I'm very grateful uh, to the Minister for giving way. I, I think also I wonder if the parameters of that proxy, i.e. whether there are particular issues when the member is giving a uh, proxy, are also uh, important to consider as parameters as well as the duration and the circumstances. Minister. Well, uh, Mr Johnson brings me to the next line in my speech, which is uh, a balance also requires between recognising the personal circumstances of the members and the representations, representations of the constituents' interests in Parliament as well. Uh, so the Scottish Government notes that uh, the House of Commons, the Speaker, has oversight in the equivalent arrangements down there as well. Whether proxy voting is to be permitted for all types of parliamentary business is also requires careful consideration. The Scottish Government will closely follow developments in this area, including the operation and experience of the pilot scheme. Presiding officer and the Chamber will be pleased to hear that I do not propose to take up much more time. I consider it beneficial for many members as possible to offer their thoughts on this committee's report. So, in conclusion, the Scottish Government commends the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee for its work on these matters. We welcome the Committee's report, its findings and direction of its recommendations for Parliament's further consideration. We also note the scope for the Parliament to derive long-term benefits for many new ways of working and, in so doing, build further resilience into not only the operation of the Parliament but also into the Scottish, uh, Scottish governments in general. I look forward, President Officer, to hearing other contributions in this very important debate. Thank you, Minister. 
I now call on Stephen Kerr to open on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Around six minutes, please, Mr Kerr. So I too would add my congratulations to the convener and the committee on their report and their ongoing work. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to speak on the topic of parliamentary reform and although the minister might have thought he had seen the last of me as a sparring partner, here we go again, I want to assure him that my interest in parliamentary reform remains as strong as ever. And I must say, and I repeat, I've always found the minister to be someone who genuinely believes in the scrutinising powers and the powers and authorities of this parliament and I respect that enormously. The committee's report covers a number of issues such as hybrid working and proxy voting as we've heard. In my time in the parliamentary bureau, I, was, I considered both of these issues when drafting the Conservative and Unionist Party's response to the committee. Personally, though, while I know that hybrid working is here to stay, I don't think it's necessarily changed everything for the better, and I absolutely believe there's no adequate substitution online for an in-person debate. However, I do believe in proxy voting, and I think it should exist fundamentally in the case of parental leave. And I also believe that the party whip's office should not be in charge of allocating proxy votes. The member on leave should be the one to choose who will vote for them, and I look forward to seeing how any upcoming trial might progress. And I think we should start that trial as quickly as possible so we can make the assessment. The report also mentioned the iterative approach Parliament will take in identifying and implementing reform going forward, and I fully support that as well. My concern is that in the past, on behalf of the Scottish Government, the Minister has raised a view that changes to Parliament would need to be done in one go, instead of as what he described as a piecemeal approach. But firstly, I would point out uh, gently that parliamentary reforms are not his or the Scottish Government's gift to give. His comment actually highlighted something that I'm deeply concerned about, which is the blurred lines between government, the executive, and parliament, and how that has been allowed to happen over the last couple of decades since devolution. I, uh, he simply assumed, I think, in the answer he gave in a previous debate, that the government's word would be final in respect to parliamentary reform. Now, the SNP view, uh, sometimes I'm afraid, and this is the perception I have, Minister, uh, uh, presiding officer to the minister, uh, that um, the SNP view this parliament as a branch of government, and I fear that Parliament sometimes has started to succumb to this view. And of course I will. Minister. Uh, I, I, there's nothing I can do about Mr Kerr's perceptions of what I say and his interpretations, but I fear he has veered uh, quite far from what my intention was. If that misunderstanding was because of anything I've said, I apologise, Mr Kerr, but I fear it might have been Mr Kerr's interpretation. Stephen Kerr. I'm very grateful for the Minister's clarification. Once again, he's been true to the colours that I did pin on him at the beginning of my speech, which is someone who is a genuine parliamentarian. Because what I would say about the iterative pro uh, process of improvement and reform is that anyone that has had any connection with any kind of project management knows full well that it, this process has its merits. It delivers change in an agile way, which allows for greater focus on individual changes, and so I was very pleased to see the committee back it, and I'm even more pleased to hear the minister agree with it. And thirdly, it'll be no surprise, uh, it's no surprise uh, to me that the Scottish Government um, uh, at one time, uh, and I accept the minister's correction, might have wanted this done in one fell swoop because that would have been a great excuse for not doing anything. But I receive his word as a man of honour that that is not the position of the Scottish Government, and he as a minister has spoken it into the official record. Now... <laughs> Minister. I fear, presiding officer, that Mr Kerr has reinterpreted his reinterpretation of what I said previously. Uh, what I did say was at that set meeting we were at that uh, it was better to do parliamentary reform in the one big area. At no time did I say it was in the Scottish Government's control to do it. I have said throughout my speech here today and any other time that it's the Scottish Parliament uh, that makes that, these decisions and how Parliament works. Stephen Kerr. And the Minister is showing admirable accountability to Parliament in the way that he is allowing uh, me to be corrected through his interventions. And I am pleased to hear all of these interventions and welcome them. And, but I do hope the Minister, because I know his position is genuine, but I also hope it reflects that of his party, because sometimes I think the SNP quite likes a weakened Parliament so that they as an executive can go roughshod over procedures and practices and conventions, such as I've mentioned in two interventions in relation to a forthcoming bill. 
But what should this parliament be, presiding officer? I've long argued that the powers of this parliament to scrutinize government are too weak. And government has ignored motions they don't like. The government has imposed its will on our acclaimed committee system. I'm afraid too often it appears to me, of course I will. Katie Clark. The member has got experience of another place. Does he not accept that all governments do that? And whilst he's absolutely correct in what he's saying, that that is a feature of the executive, which is something that we collectively need to address. Stephen Kerr. I completely agree with that. And whether I was speaking here or in another parliament, I would say the same thing. The parliament provides an f- absolutely crucially important constitutional role in checking and uh, holding to account the powers of the executive. And that's true here as it is at, at Westminster. But I don't like to think that the government whips its committee members. But sometimes, frankly, I am left with that conclusion because of the evidence of my experience in this place since since elected. And I don't think it's right because of the design of the committee system that we should be led by anything other than evidence that builds consensus in committees that then produces reports that are based on evidence and not on political dogma. Committee rooms cannot simply turn out to be echo chambers for government orthodoxy. Bob Doris. Um, I'll be summing up later on as Deputy Chair of the Committee, but I'm just wondering if you think the Standards Committee has done its best to, without political interference, political dogma, a balanced view to reflect the views of Parliament in a very measured, responsible way. Stephen Kerr. I absolutely do, and I'm very pleased to be able to agree with uh, Bob Doris on that point. I have wider concerns that come from this report in terms of the spontaneity of Parliament. And I'm afraid sometimes that, and it's not true today, before anyone intervenes, that sometimes the proceedings of this chamber sometimes feel like a stage-managed, scripted puppet show. And, And because of that, we're not getting the respect of people that observe our proceedings. It's quite hard to observe our proceedings. This debate, if you wanted to watch it, you'd have to go through a myriad number of Google searches and clicks to be able to find it. That in itself causes me concern, because this parliament needs to have the respect, should earn the respect, of the people of Scotland, but the people of Scotland need to be able to see the proceedings of this place. And it needs to be more spontaneous and more responsive. So, for example, the presiding officer has the power to call urgent questions. Why doesn't the presiding officer have the power to call an urgent debate? I think they should have that power. I said to the presiding officer the other day on leaving the bureau, my motto is more power to the presiding officer. And, and, and I in need that to... regard, the presiding officer will now <laughs> seek the cooperation of the member in bringing his remarks to close because I have been generous, as the member indeed you, has been generous himself in taking you, the you, you have indeed. I have much more that I wanted to say. <laughs> but I will simply close on this point, the need for this place to be rigorous in its debate. The programme for government. May I close with the example of the programme for government? We all sat through a half hour where the First Minister enjoyed interruption-free, intervention-free speaking time. But the first response to that statement was a speech from Douglas Ross, which was subject to interventions and interruptions. I don't think the government should have protection from the rigours of this place. I don't think the First Minister needs the protection of the presiding officer to have that kind of time. And so I would simply say, in drawing a comparison, with Westminster, with the Prime Minister, who gave that very important energy statement on the 8th Mr. of September. Mr Kerr, I think you are digressing us a, a wee bit in terms of where you said you would end up. So yeah. we do want to allow other members, and I'm sure I, there will uh, be opportunities in intervening across the afternoon. I, 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 I appreciate that point. I think I've made my point about rigour, spontaneity and debate, which this place needs to deser- get a deserved reputation for. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call on Rhoda Grant to open on behalf of Scottish Labour. Um, around five minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I want to start by thanking the committee for their report. Um, it's right that the Parliament keeps its procedures under review and ensures they are modernised as required. That said, none of us could have possibly foreseen the impact of COVID-19 on our procedures that the Parliament successfully found and implemented a system to enable people to participate in parliamentary business so quickly is down to our support staff, those people behind the scenes who work hard 
to find solutions. And I won't, on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party, and I'm sure other parties would also concur, to thank them for that. And I also want the, to thank them for their patience while we all got the hang of the system and indeed some of us are still grappling with it. They must be so looking forward to the new system coming online as well. Meeting online in a hybrid format or in person is always a balance. Each system has benefits and drawbacks. We took meeting in person for granted, as we have seen during the pandemic, there are times that that's not possible or even safe. Before the pandemic, pe and people came into the building, they were quite often unwell, but they had to come in simply to take part in proceedings. Colds and viruses spread because of that. And if they didn't come in, they weren't able to represent their constituents. Because we now have a hybrid system set up to deal with COVID-19, people who would otherwise not have been able to participate can. However, those taking part remotely do lose out. The flow of the debate is more stilted. It's difficult to read the mood of the debate if you're working remotely. And our system, I'm hoping that the new system will um, enable people online to intervene and indeed those in the chamber to intervene on those online. What you can't replicate is the meeting and chatting with people around the debate, exchanging more information or even having informal chats with ministers and cabinet secretaries. All activities that are really useful in enabling us to represent our constituents. So we need a balance, to balance that against the benefit of those who are unwell or who have caring responsibilities being able to take part. And certainly, from my point of view, allowing people at a distance to take part in giving evidence to committees has been really successful as well, because often I would suggest people from the Highlands and Islands to come to committee only to discover they couldn't commit that time. So it also allows the Parliament to open up um, and take evidence from all over Scotland. Briefly. Stephen Kerr. Makes, Rhoda Grant's making very important points about the nature of debate. Does Rhoda Grant think it would be helpful in this place in terms of the flow of debate if we banned laptops, iPads and the use of iPhones in the chamber? Rhoda Grant. As, as someone who is, is, is pretty much chained to my, not my iPhone, I would have to say, my, my Samsung, I don't think I would like that. I would feel absolutely bereft if it were to be banned from the chamber. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm warning up to that. <laughs> Got support. <laughs> Thank you. My colleague has supported me. Um, presiding officer, the last parliament saw a number of women standing down because the parliament really was not family friendly as to allow them to bring up their children in the way they were happy with and be parliamentarians at the same time. And I think that's really disappointing. However, rather than responding to this positively to find solutions, the parliament appears to have become even less family friendly. Here we are in a new term yet late sittings and variable decision times are causing real problems to members. A decision time running a few minutes late can impact on what train a member can catch or indeed a member of staff and whether they can pick up their children as organised. As can adding statements at the last minute and pushing decision time way back, we should adhere to an, a, a set decision time if we're going to be family friendly. The Scottish Government needs to be more organised with regard to business planning and support the family-friendly ethos that this Parliament was set up to deliver. I really don't want to see a system where those with caring responsibilities need to remain remote because the Scottish Parliament cannot be more disciplined. People, as I said before, people who are working remotely um, lose out with other activities of the Parliament, so they must have the choice and flexibility. Due to fluctuating decision times, a number of members have indicated to me that they drive rather than take the train because of this, and I include myself in that. For people who live away from home, though, while attending the Parliament, it never was family friendly, and remote working could provide an alternative to that. Turning quickly, if I may, to proxy voting, I believe there is a place for this within our system. I think we currently have a pairing system for those on maternity leave, but a proxy system could work just as well, and it could be used at times of sick leave 
and compassionate leave where remote voting does not work. And I'm glad the committee are going to pursue this, albeit with some caution. I'm also pleased that the committee are keeping an eye on future developments and what the parliament should look like in 10 years. One of the advantages of the new parliament is there were no traditions or cultures. And over the years, I've seen that each new parliament is very different from the last. And I like that. I hope the Scottish Parliament continues to evolve due to circumstances and challenges, remaining fresh and modern while retaining its founding ethos. Thank you, uh, Ms Grant. And we will now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of around four minutes. And I call Emma Roddick to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I apologise to Stephen Kerr for having the audacity to read this off a screen. Um, I want to start by saying that I really welcome not only the report, but the fact that an inquiry was carried out at all. I think given the talent that this place has lost due to working practices that many consider anachronistic, it is, in my opinion, overdue. Um, but I'm aware that many would have liked to see it happen in around Never's time, so I thank the committee for doing it and for allowing me to give evidence. I think this place really can be a bubble. Um, things that wouldn't even register as an issue for most feel like the battle of the day. Uh, who gets called for a supplementary, which reception your colleague chose to go to, whether your synonym made it into a committee report, all of these things I've seen cause serious rage and upset, and those listening know who they are. This bubble is more pronounced when you live far from this building. Last year, in my first few weeks as an MSP, I realised that sitting on the train somewhere around Dalwhinnie, I would feel like I'd passed through a portal and returned to Earth from some other planet where we breathe coffee instead of air and use votes as currency. Central Belt politicians, with few exceptions, do not understand the different challenges experienced by representatives of other places before you even consider caring responsibilities, disability or other factors. They do not understand the travel, the extra time needed just to get around and speak to constituents. My work travel so far this year has been the equivalent of 50% of the circum circumference of the earth. For many that I want to meet in my island communities, my recess is their holidays, and they often shut up shops and businesses with many using the Scottish Government's annual gift of two return ferry journeys to come over to the mainland for a bit. And when explaining that being here on a Tuesday morning and then later than five on a Thursday means that I can't carry out regional work on a Monday or a Friday, the so-called constituency days, I've been told that my constituents want to see me here every day. And it's not true. For the most part, in Highlanders' and Islanders' minds, being here every week is a sign that I am not doing my job. The north of my region is further away from this building than the House of Commons is. That's as the crow flies before you even take into consideration transport routes. Presiding officer, I represent people who live further away from your seat than Liz Trusses when she does PMQs. And I'm sure that my colleagues, particularly my SNP colleagues, will understand why folk living there maybe don't feel connected to decisions made this far away from those they affect. In 2015, the then Scottish Cabinet came to Inverness to listen and be visible. I went along and I asked Nicola Sturgeon how she was encouraging 18-year-old chukters like me to be politically involved. Being there is how she was doing that. That was progress, but we need to keep it going. Technology now allows us to vote, to contribute to debates, to scrutinise legislation and ministers from anywhere with an internet connection. If we want the Highlands and Islands to feel represented, to feel heard, if we want Highlands and Islands representatives to be able to connect to people out with this bubble and know what's going on on the ground, we need to be able to be reliably in our region. In my very first speech in this place, I applauded the hybrid system and I said I was looking forward to doing my job from here, but also from Skye, Sutherland and Shetland from time to time. Acceptance in this place of more flexible, more inclusive and frankly better working practices is not where it needs to be. I hope that this report and all its detail will mean that next time we don't lose more Gail Rosses, more Aileen Campbells and maybe some more of the rural and island voices that we've been hearing are so important to government decisions over recent weeks can dial into the conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Roddick. I now call Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Paul McLennan. Uh, Mr Carlaw. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Actually, I come to this debate not sure if I've got anything terribly useful to say and before some of you say there's no change there then um, 
let me say that I do have a number of observations. And the first really was, I think, something I said in the original first debate was that I actually didn't think I would be open to change, but then to my surprise found that I thought it actually worked perfectly well and to the benefit of the Parliament and have become therefore quite a fan and quite an advocate of it. But I think the first point I would start from is when do you take the view that we are at a settled position on which to make any judgments? And I reflect that it, it's really only, take out the summer recess, quite a short working period for this Parliament since we resumed back to an environment in which we didn't have social distancing within the chamber. Uh, and therefore, you know, what has become almost quite normal again quite quickly uh, is actually not a practice that we've lived with for very long. And I notice that the number of contributions that are now being made remotely has, dis has shrunk to really very, very few altogether. But again, I reflect that who knows what's coming this winter. We could find that there is a major flu epidemic or a revival of some other instance or, or very bad weather, as, as, as Martin Whitfield said, and the whole remote um, uh, engagement of uh, members within the chamber could change again. So I think we just have to be very careful and watch how this all develops over a period of time and not rush to any settled views as to when we're at the point where we can say this is now how it should be. Let's keep an open mind. Yeah. Daniel Johnson. Grateful to the member. Does it not also exemplify though that we can actually change quite quickly and, and well but by the very remarks that he's just given? Yes. yes, we can. And I think that's the point. But I think we must be careful that we don't close down the point at which we think we are now in a position to say these are the ways in which we think this parliament could work better, because I think that they could continue to evolve and change. Um, I do actually have some sympathy, Mr Whitfield. Uh, Martin, Whitfield? <laughs> Martin Whitfield? <laughs> I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Do you not also agree that Part of the value in this report is the empowerment that in particular backbenchers have when the situation is correct, just as we've heard about distances, that the hybrid nature is still available to them. And just because not necessarily you see it every day does not mean it's not available when circumstances mean, and they're very broad circumstances, that you need to use it to represent your constituents on an important matter that's happening here in this chamber. Oh, I, I absolutely do agree with that and I don't think you have to be at a great remote distance. I can say as a constituency member in the central belt that there are days when I feel I could have much more productively represented my constituents by being in the constituency and actually participating in a number of things that were taking place which would, have re which would directly have benefited them than actually being as I was historically here sometimes to participate in five minutes of business and then hang around till five o'clock for a decision time which was a wholly unproductive use of time and I think that yes that is one of the really imp one of the real uh, advantages that has been demonstrated during the hybrid working arrangements. I do want to agree with Mr Kerr on one point though and that is the use of remote technology in the chamber uh, because I do believe people should put up or shut up and one of the things that I don't like is when members do not intervene in a debate but from a sedentary position then tweet out from the chamber that what some, somebody else in the chamber said was absolute rubbish and they, th they fundamentally disagreed with it. I mean, I, I just don't think that's quite right. And I think, therefore, we should start to consider afresh just in what way uh, social media should be used if we want this place to have the respect and to sort of evolve in terms not just of the infrastructure but the way in which we conduct ourselves. Because certainly in the years that I've been a member of the Parliament, I think that has declined uh, in terms of the courtesy that is shown and also the wider understanding of parliamentary business. We all used to get a written official report and actually people used to read what had been said in other debates beyond their own particular focus or discipline. And I think a lot of that's been lost. Um, I would also just briefly like to say that um, in 2024, we will have been 25 years old as a parliament. I think we should work towards that date, not necessarily 10 years hence, but towards that date to see what more we can actually radically do to improve the way in which the parliament works and the way in which we operate. And I have just sitting above that the fact that the Citizens, uh, uh, the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee has been charged with the whole investigation into deliberative democracy. And we obviously are awaiting the Scottish Government's response to its own working group on this. But that 
that too is going to provide some challenging questions for members in this parliament as to how we sit alongside a culture of deliberative engagement in our, part, in our, in our politics. And so my view is, uh, if I can finish, because Mr. Greer was here for the last session, I know he's a big fan of Churchill. Can I just therefore say this isn't the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but maybe it is the end of the beginning of our consideration as to how we might evolve as a parliament. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Carlow. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Katie Clark. Mr. McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I thank the committee for bringing forward this report to Parliament this afternoon? Can I take this chance to commend the convener, Martin Whitfield, and the vice convener, Bob Doris, along with the committee members, for the report? In May last year, there were 43 new MSPs elected, one third of all MSPs. It was a much more diverse Parliament, and we need to ensure that continues. We were all elected in the midst of COVID, and alternative forms of working was a norm for many months. It is great that the Standards Committee agreed to look at future parliamentary procedures and practices and allow the opportunity to debate this this afternoon. Now, I was fortunate enough to be a member of the Standards Committee for a period and know how much work went into that report. In December last year, as the convener said, there was a debate held by the committee to inform key, inquiries, if key areas for the, uh, the inquiry. A range of issues were debated and the com uh, committee agreed to look at some of the following areas. We talked about scrutiny and debate and what was it best conducted in hybrid or virtual formats. Uh, the resource implication of virtual participation uh, not really been touched upon. Uh, wider changes to procedures and practices that would improve parliamentary scrutiny. And of course, it's been touched on different methods of voting, including proxy voting. I want to look at some of these in the short time I have this afternoon. On hybrid and virtual meetings, I think when we came into the parliament, as I said, you know, we were straight into the, to the, to the, virtual, the virtual meetings. Uh, and and that, I think that, that went quite well. Um, and of course, it made the Parliament, I think, more inclusive and accessible for everybody. And Emma uh, uh, Roddick's touched on it, Rhoda Grant's touched on that as well. That's surely a key issue. Uh, the report uh, also says it would provide the Parliament with the flexibility in the future to offer alternative means of participating in parliamentary business, rather than requiring elected members to fit into established methods of working, notwithstanding their personal circumstances. And again, Jackson Carlow touched on that uh, as well, and I think that's really important. The committee also stated the impact of hybrid working, uh, working should be monitored over the longer term to assess the extent to which they provide for equal participation in parliamentary business, promote diversity, and support participation levels. Again, very, very important. On the virtual uh, participation, the committee was of the view uh, like committees like the chamber should continue to have the capacity to hold hybrid meetings. And I think probably over that, that period of time that I've been involved in the various committees. The, the, the virtual meetings have gone very well, and I think that that's something that needs to, to continue, and it gives more flexibility to, to members, to witnesses in that regard as well, and I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, so I think that's one of the key things. The committee also believes that members uh, being present supports effective and collaborative work in undertaking scrutiny for this reason, considers the normal expectation should the members be come to the Parliament to participate in committee meetings. Again, that's maybe a bit debate, and we've kind of heard that, and that's maybe something for the committee to consider in that regard. The committee also welcomed the introduction of the new platform for remote participation in committee meetings as well as on the chamber. On proxy voting, and that's been touched by a couple of people, but something I want to look at a wee bit, the committee considered there is value in piloting a proxy voting scheme. And remembering given evidence to the committee, this was an issue that, that was brought up and, and well, well debated at that particular time. And personally for myself, it's something that I would very much uh, support in that regard. Uh, in terms of the consultant, how a scheme would work with the function with a view to proposing a temporary rule which would provide for a scheme that would permit members in certain defined circumstances, including parental leave and illness, to nominate a proxy. The committee suggested that such a scheme should be allowed to run for a period of around 12 months and any permanent changes to provide proxy voting should be considered following a full evaluation of the scheme. And I think that's quite correct in that approach and probably come back to this or within the chamber itself. Right, officer, in conclusion, the committee quoted a witness saying that this inquiry, we should be thinking about what the Parliament should look like in 10 years' time. And the Parliament should commit to a culture of iterative change to allow it to be more representative, more open and more accessible. For me, this was a key closing line in the report. This will allow us to attract a more diverse range of candidates to stand for election to the Parliament. It also hopes that the Parliament can be more exclusive, inclusive, seeking evidence from witnesses all over Scotland who reflect Scottish society more fully. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLennan. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome this report and the recommendations in relation to hybrid working and remote voting, which I do believe enable MSPs to better balance their responsibilities in this Parliament, in their constituencies, 
and indeed support family friendly practices. And I agree with the point that Rhoda Grant has made in relation to fixed times for decision making, helping for those that have caring responsibilities, but indeed um, for other commitments also. The proposals um, for a pilot um, for proxy voting, um, I believe, are something that we should support, particularly for members suffering long-term illness, having an operation, um, or on maternity leave. And I agree with the point being made by Stephen Carr that it should be for the member themselves um, to choose who that proxy should be. Um, I think it's fair to say that I do think that the way that this parliament operated remote voting during the pandemic maximised the participation of members, particularly in voting. And that didn't always happen in other parliaments. So in particular, I think the use of the point of order where the technology failed was a feature um, that was used in this parliament that wasn't always used um, in other parliaments. And I think that scepticism and cynicism about the reliability of technology is also something we need to incorporate in our working patterns because we're very reliant on the technology that we have available to us. Um, and so I look forward to the day where we have the technology that interventions are possible. I think that will make a considerable difference um, both in relation to the person intervening um, and able to intervene perhaps on somebody um, who is making a virtual um, uh, contribution, but also indeed those making contributions in this chamber. I believe that any move towards hybrid working has to be done in a way that allows for effective scrutiny so that ministers and key witnesses should continue to need to be present to be scrutinised in person. And I think it's worth noting um, that these proposals have come out of consensus, but it may well be that many of the changes um, that this parliament needs um, are not necessarily um, fully agreed or um, would lead to a consensus in this parliament now. And I do think that we need to recognise that we have to debate how we ensure um, that this parliament operates in a more effective way and that we listen to some of the criticisms that have been made and have already been referred to. So I do think that there's wider changes that are needed. We need to look at how we scrutinise legislation, about the quality of some of the legislation that the parliament is asked to look at. We need to look at why some are calling for a second chamber to provide that scrutiny function. And we need to take on board some of the criticisms that are being made about the lack of spontaneity, about stage management that's been referred to, and an increasing choreography. Um, and that is partly um, as a result of the way that we organise ourselves. So I think we are right to be positive um, about what is successful in this parliament. And there's much about this culture which is a massive step forward. But we have to also look at the criticisms. And therefore, I do hope um, that we look at the founding principles of this parliament. We look at how we can, for example, improve freedom of information legislation. So there's a presumption in favour of publication, that we look at the rights of individual MPs, how um, this place operates, how speakers are chosen, and, and how committees can be more effective. Um, and I hope very much um, that the committee um, will look at these issues, that we have a transparent review of this Parliament's processes, and that um, these are debates that continue to happen. Thank you. Thank you. I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you, President Officer. As the only female member of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, I am happy to speak in this debate and I want to focus on the challenges and opportunities of hybrid working. I thank the committee clerks uh, for all their help in getting us to this stage. And in our report, we noted that the Scottish Parliament was ahead of the game compared to other institutions with appropriate measures to um, to ensure that committee and chamber business continued and that members were able to participate sufficiently and vote. 
I want to pay tribute to all the Scottish Parliament staff who were instrumental in making the switch to digital chamber sessions at the beginning of the pandemic and who have continued to work hard to improve this and develop the hybrid model we now have. Going forward, many of the committee's conclusions focused on the need to continue with hybrid arrangements to give members the flexibility to participate remotely. And I think it's important that we build on the lessons learned over the course of the remote and hybrid participation and to try to improve the experience as a new platform should do. The potential for proxy voting was also considered as part of this inquiry. And it will be interesting to see what happens next with that, including any pilot trial. For committee meetings, the ability to have witnesses join remotely brings clear benefits and possibly makes it easier to facilitate evidence sessions. And for cross-party groups, a permanent hybrid model for meetings could ensure we maximise public engagement with the Parliament and ensure CPGs are as accessible as possible to members of the public. And when it comes to accessibility for MSPs and members of the public, there is a need to consider people with disabilities, women and people from rural or remote areas. For, for example, Hi, yes, happy to take it. Martin a Whitfield. Well, to Colette Stevenson giving way. And um, I know both as a committee and certainly from my point of view, returning to the gender balance of committees is uh, not far in the future. So I give warning on that because it is a very important element. Does she not agree, though, that one of the interesting aspects of the evidence that we heard about witnesses are those who are actually challenged by the very nature of this building to come in? and that actually being able to give evidence remotely with support from officers within the parliament often allows people to share their experiences that otherwise would go silent in this chamber. Colette Stevenson. I thank the member for that intervention and I wholeheartedly agree with you and having attended several CPGs on that, uh, that is uh, firmly evident uh, um, and, and we see that regularly in the attendance as well compared to having to be able to uh, come in and actually attend uh, this building. Um, so, for, for, so, for example, we know that in general women are disproportionately impacted when it comes to care and responsibilities, so hybrid working in Parliament could ease some of this burden. I also very much welcome the presiding officer's gender sensitive audit, which will investigate the representation and participation of women in the Scottish Parliament. The SPPA committee will commission an, an academic to do a full analysis and consider who is participating virtually and see what else can be done. An interesting bit of evidence we received was from Karen Bradley MP, Chair of the House of Commons Procedure Committee, who told us that female MPs were participating more during virtual proceedings than they had previously. We also heard from Professor Meg Russell, who cautioned that ongoing hybrid work should be well defined so that we avoid a situation where the only people attending Parliament in person are the non-disabled white men. Overall, in our report, we have recognised that Parliament is most effective when MSPs are in Holyrood. But there are circumstances where remote participation is necessary, as has been pointed out by several members in the debate today. For example, during periods of illness or bereavement, or particularly with winter approaching, and if there are any travel or weather disruptions, me members could still be able to vote and participate. One possibility could be that every member engages virtually, say once per month, so that remote participation is normalised and others can do more if required. I've got very little time left, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, briefly. The, the member is already over time, I'm afraid. Would you, okay. you recognise that, that, that the virtual working does exclude some people with some disabilities? Very yeah. briefly, Ms Stevenson. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and move on as quickly as possible. Thank you. There are lots of thing, uh, things to think about uh, in terms of that um, and what you pointed out and about as Parliament adapts, but any change is, as iterative, is an iterative process has already been pointed out and not an end of parliamentary reform. This report sets out many sound recommendations and I hope members and others find it useful. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Alexander Stewart.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too would like to thank the members of the SPPA Committee for their work on this inquiry and all who gave evidence. One of the key points from the report was, the Scot was that the Scottish Parliament, compared to other legis legislators, in introduced more measures to ensure that their members could continue to participate, functions of Parliament could continue. I would like to place on record our thanks to all those who made that possible and worked to ensure that the Parliament could continue to function. As a new MSP and an MSP with a disability, the hybrid system has allowed me to participate when I otherwise may have struggled to be here or may have exacerbated my condition as a result of trying to get here, or indeed, like this week, when I am recovering from a cold. We rightly were proud at the start of this session when Scotland elected its most diverse parliament yet. I hope that by continuing and improving remote participation, that we may have more people considering putting themselves forward to stand. We cannot be complacent or content with the progress we have made so far. As well as diversity within elected representatives, the hybrid system has allowed committees to take evidence from those that we may otherwise have been unable to have physically present. This opens up opportunities to, either hear, to hear either formally or informally from groups and individuals who, for health reasons, caring responsibilities or travel implications, could not normally have attended Parliament. Remote participation is also one way to move towards the Parliament's net zero ambitions, as was pointed out by this, the corporate body's contribution to the Committee's report. I hope that in Committee these factors will continue to be taken into consideration and remote participation offered as a genuine alternative, rather than simply seeing a default return to in-person participation. I do take on board the comments in the report that, particularly for committee proceedings, the current system is not ideal for discussion compared to having everyone in the room. I hope that the upcoming rollout of the new system will allow hybrid proceedings to more accurately reflect how chamber and committee business functions. I agree with the committee that there should not be a system to request remote participation, and this should be left to the discretion of individuals. Putting in a system to request remote participation would, in my view, be onerous. Proxy voting has been mentioned and was mentioned in the report and would, in my view, be a good addition to the adaption so far. The report notes that the committee considers there is value in piloting a proxy voting system and that the committee would consult on how a scheme would function. Proxy voting would allow those who are unable to attend remote sessions to still have their votes cast and their constituents represented. In paragraph 194, the report refers to certain defined circumstances, including parental leave and illness. And I would ask that in their consultation, the committee adds bereavement leave into the list of eligibility for a proxy vote. I do not think anyone in the chamber would expect a member to have to be present after the loss of a loved one. We believe that the system used for request, requesting proxy voting mirror HR practices conducted elsewhere in Parliament. We expect our staff teams to give sick notes, and while I respect everyone's right to privacy, privacy, especially in terms of their health, this would provide a straightforward way to request proxy voting. We should be aware, however, that caring or parental responsibilities that would stop a member from being able to vote can happen suddenly, and whatever process we design should be adaptable to these situations. I also recognise the comments made by those early on parameters for a scheme, and this will take careful consideration and is probably not something we will sort this afternoon. Finally, presiding officer on committee substitutes, we would very much welcome a wider conversation on substitute arrangements for committees. The suspension of standing orders during the first part of this session allowed parties to adapt quickly where someone was ill or unavailable. We would like to see this flexibility made permanent. It provides greater flexibility to parties and has the potential to stop knock-on disruption to multiple committees from one MSP absence. Presiding officer, I am pleased that there is agreement to keep the hybrid system. I believe this it will not only allow the current chamber the ability to deal with their workload, health and families in a way that is flexible and manageable, but if we continue to make progress, it may be the change required to ensure that more people consider standing for elected office in 2026. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be able to speak in this debate as this Parliament considers how it will carry out its business in the most effective way possible, just as the Scottish public rightly expect. As with many modern Parliaments, the Scottish Parliament has always strived 
to be flexible, open and accommodating to members from all different backgrounds as possible. It is therefore to the Parliament's credit that Scotland was ahead of the curve in responding to the pandemic and introducing changes that made uh, all members and that could participate in parliamentary business. While remote or virtual contributions were originally introduced as a necessity, members will be in agreement that the period helped shine a light on what were seen as old ways of thinking. For example, in committee sessions, the hybrid format has significantly expanded the potential pool of witnesses at any session. The committee process is a vital part of the scrutiny provided by this Parliament, and there is no doubt that the certain aspects of this process are now much more effective because of the hybrid format. But it is clear that the introduction of virtual contributions to the Chamber, particularly during debates, has not been entirely unproblematic. While these contributions were clearly made seamless, it was first introduced back in 2020, there is clear and is clear that the divide between contributions made here in the Chamber and those remotely were problematic. While there have been many important improvements and contributions that were made through the virtual format, even though it can't be said that any heartfelt contribution, they did not deeply be involved in the debate because they were not here in the chamber. Uh, they may have been on a remote situation, but the chamber is sometimes where the, the current thrust was, was able to be participated. As often was pointed out, it was only made worse by the fact that contributions could neither be uh, received or have uh, interventions. Indeed, losing that spontaneity uh, remarked, uh, people felt that there was a, a, it was a price to pay, but one that they were not prepared to uh, go forward with. As such, I hope that the proposed hybrid platform is able to properly address the issue, and I look forward to seeing that happen, uh, Presiding Officer. Going forward, it should be up to members and ensure that the members' contributions within debates. The Scottish public expect to see MSPs representing them as effectively as possible in the Parliament, and they'll be able to judge for themselves whether this is the case. Given Parliament's role in holding the government to account, it would be reasonable that the is discarded from the extent to ministers in the same way. It's important that ministers are subject to the highest possible level of scrutiny, something which can only take place, I believe, here in the chamber. Presiding officer, the parliament is already a better place as a result of the hybrid measures introduced two years ago, but there is still much more work to be done to ensure that there is a, a complimentation about business and we don't detract or diminish the role that takes place within here. This remains uh, to be seen and the in-person uh, contributions in the Parliament will be very much to the fore as we move forward. So in conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, we all want to see a Parliament that can accommodate members from as many different backgrounds as possible. I know that it can be achieved without diluting this Parliament's vital role in our democracy. By setting aside time for this debate today, we have set uh, a, a clear goal that we're trying to achieve that. Alongside other members of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, I will continue to work collectively and correspondent to make sure that we strive to try, strike the balance that is required because there is a balance to be required to ensure that we accommodate, that we support, but we also encourage members. New members, as we've heard, many new members came to this parliament uh, and it's taken them some time to get used to the format because the format has not been the same as it's been in previous sessions. So we have a lot to learn, but we've also a lot to give. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call Rona Mackay, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the COVID pandemic has changed all of our lives forever. We had no choice but to make changes to our lives while restrictions were put in place to keep us safe. Working at home where possible was the key to keeping businesses going, and people adapted well to that. So well, in fact, that many employers have changed their business model to accommodate this. Like everything else, there are negatives as well as positives, but at least now there is choice. Out of necessity and not before time, we're looking at family-friendly options, a better work-life balance and doing business dif differently. As we've heard, the Standards Committee took time to strike a balance when it came to adapting the working practice in the Parliament. With an eye on the future, the committee decided that the pandemic had been a watershed and it was an opportune time to be examine practices since Parliament began in 1999. All praise must go to Parliament authorities who reacted quickly to introduce a remote voting system uh, to enable normal business to continue while more, most staff were working from home. 
There were teething problems, of course, but these were largely overcome as time went on. The report shows that there was a variety of views and opinions when it came to deciding whether hybrid meetings should continue, which is hardly surprising in a place full of opinionated politicians. So the majority view had to prevail, and that was to seize the opportunity for greater flexibility and to become more accessible and inclusive to encourage diversity. Hybrid voting allows members with caring responsibilities to fulfil their duties, those who are ill and take into account unforeseen family emergencies or travel, travel difficulties. And as the committee report says, and my colleague Colette Stevenson also, it is important to note that in comparison to other legislators, according to the evidence taken by the committee, the Scottish Parliament has introduced more measures to allow important business and scrutiny to continue, and I welcome that. Proxy voting was another issue of important focus for the committee, and again, as we've heard, this is the subject of a pilot that can be fully evaluated before any permanent changes to the Parliament's rules and procedures are made. And again, I look, look forward to that. This would be an important development, and I, I really do hope that, that this comes to fruition. Uh, presiding officer, I'm fully supportive of the proposals in this excellent support, and I think it does strike a sensible and realistic balance. However, the hybrid platform does not and should not replicate in-person participation in parliamentary business. There's no doubt that fewer interventions, not possible yet in the remote system, reduces the quality of debate. Those participating remotely can feel isolated and lose out on the atmosphere of any debate. Committee work in Parliament is crucial for introducing legislation, conducting inquiries and scrutiny on the issues that keep Scotland running. However, remote participation can be limiting, both for members and witnesses giving evidence, and should always be a last resort in my view. However, the Committee notes that the Conveners Group's uh, support for the production of guidance to accompany the formalisation of long-term hybrid capability for committees and suggests that guidance on committees be updated is eminently sensible in my view. So in conclusion, and most importantly, presiding officer, members in this chamber were elected to represent our constituents in Scotland's parliament, and it's vital that we do just that. Unless exceptional or urgent constituency work and inter-parliamentary business um, should be undertaken on non-sitting days, we should be here. The, the default position is that parliamentarians should be at their place of work on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, allowing time in the constituencies on Mondays and Fridays. I think the public deserve nothing less. Technology has given us options, which I welcome, and I believe this report sets out the way ahead. Thank you. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches, and I call on Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the committee uh, for its excellent work, but actually, more importantly, thank them for the opportunity that they've given us all to actually talk about the way that we work, but most importantly, how we can make this place better. Because I think it's only by actually having the time and the space to talk about ideas, about what works and what doesn't, that we can do that. And I think I, I would reflect that we have too few of these opportunities. So I would uh, encourage uh, the committee to think about what future reports it can bring forward to the Parliament so we can have further opportunities to discuss this, because it's important that we make progress. I can also say that I, I, I also uh, really am very thankful for the, actually the very broad uh, scope of the report itself. I mean, while it is uh, looking at, at the proposals of accessibility, the use of technology and proxy voting, I thought some of the reflections about actually the nature of what uh, takes place in this place, the, the broader uh, uh, nature of discourse, the fact that debates aren't just confined to the chamber or the committee room, that actually face-to-face -face is, is important too, is uh, important. I think that's one of the, the things that we've been discussing this afternoon. Um, I think it's also important to be very mindful that there is a difference between the work that we do here in the chamber and the committee, and the demands of, of scrutiny, and actually the varied nature of what different uh, forms of technology enable us to do. And there is no doubt that I think virtual working does make this place more accessible, and that is a very good thing. And can I just say, I thought Emma Roddick's uh, contribution was really excellent about reminding us what, what is actually important about the job we do, because it is fundamentally important it, to serve our constituents, to hear what they have got to say, to understand their concerns and to represent them. And if technology makes that more feasible, I think she's absolutely right that, that we must uh, 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 embrace it and actually really entrench it in the way that we work. And in, indeed, as a central belt, and I, 
It's only two minutes walk to my constituency. I'm actually, that makes me ever more mindful about the fact that I can nip out uh, of an afternoon and do a constituency engagement, which most other members cannot. In fact, I get home to, to my own house e every night when I'm in this place, and that is something that most people do not get to do. And that is a true privilege, and it, but it does make me think about what more we can do to make sure that happens. But it is not a panacea. I think, as Rhoda Grant uh, pointed out, that it's actually important to be able to take pay part in that wider participation. That I, I think I would caution the thought that somehow virtual work at work is the only way that we make this place family friendly or accessible. Actually, the things that we do in terms of our timetabling about the other provisions and the support we provide in this place are just as important, if not more so. Indeed, I, I'm very happy to complain. Stephen Kerr. Can I tempt the member onto the subject of decision time? A number of colleagues, in relation to family friendly hours, have mentioned this constant moving of decision time. Would it not be better, given the fact that decision time only moves because of the business that's allotted the time? the chamber sitting, would it not be better if there was one night a week where we sat for longer and then had a set decision time, maybe at seven or even at eight? Because I can see he's going to have something to say, so I'll give, way. <laughs> I'll give up. Daniel Johnson. I was almost with the member up until the point he uh, uh, was uh, putting forward seven o'clock or eight o'clock decision times. What I, what I do think is that, that that perhaps our flexibility isn't about the timing of decision time, but what decisions we take at what points in time. That if, 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 if business has to continue further, it could perhaps continue after decision time for those members who want to continue to do so, and that actually the decisions could take place later. Or, but that's probably an equally bad idea to other members. My point being is that there is options we could look at about how and when we actually take the decisions in comparison to when the, that business has been uh, heard. Um, likewise, I think the, the, the issue of a proxy voting is critically important. I think for all manner of different reasons, whether that's bereavement, illness, uh, maternity, paternity, um, I, I think it's vitally important that we give uh, members the ability to do the most fundamental part of our job, which is to vote while we are not here. And I think proxy voting is the best way to do that, but that has to have caveats. And I think other members have, have pointed out, I think it, it should not be about giving the vote to the whip. Um, I think it has to, conclude, to be Mr. To, to members. And likewise, I think there should be very specific mandates. So I, I think we should embrace technology. We should welcome flexibility. And I think we should look forward to further opportunities to discuss how we work in this place in the future. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call on Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Unsurprisingly, as a member of this committee, I think our report is spot on. And I'd like to... <laughs> Thank the clerking team and the convener for all their support in driving the inquiry forward. And I'd like to actually welcome today's debate, which I found really interesting. I think we all agree that Parliament must embrace change, and that change must always be there to protect the core values that the Parliament was set up for. And I think the biggest change we've experienced uh, recently is the introduction of virtual technology in this chamber. Now, it was forced on us by the pandemic, and prior to the pandemic, if we're honest, our IT in this parliament was poor. Remote working would not have been possible. In fact, I remember holding a committee meeting in a room below the canteen with five committee members huddled around a screen trying to take evidence from transport for London. And we couldn't, they couldn't see us and we could hardly see them. But we've been through a change, and that change was really important because it stopped what was our democracy becoming an autocracy. But when we went through that change, we struggled with it. Members will not ever forget the technical issues that led to voting delays in the robust system that we were told we were working with. There was a complete disconnect as well in delivering virtual speakers, uh, speeches without being able to see a live feed to the chamber. I speak from some experience, having been remotely uh, forced into remote working for six months. There is nothing more, well, perhaps pleasing in my case than looking at the screen and seeing myself, but I would have liked to have seen how the speech was going down in the chamber, and that wasn't possible. And it certainly wasn't <laughs> possible to take an intervention. And the ongoing development of the hybrid parliament is now something that we can control, and we should control that. And I'm pleased to hear that post-recess, MSPs attending debates virtually 
will be able to make interventions in the chamber and they'll actually be able to see how their speech is going down in the chamber, which I think is really, really important. It will stop them feeling detached because you do feel detached speaking to a computer for what appears to be hours on end if you got the chance and the presiding officer didn't cut you off. So I think there's a lot to be done on that. But I do think that uh, virtual meetings and virtual sessions of the parliament should stop parliamentarians coming in. You know, physically attending the parliament remains crucial in my mind. And why? Well, because you can't bump into somebody for a coffee or sand them out on, on an idea on Zoom. It just doesn't happen. And that, to me, is what politics is all about. Meeting people, talking to people, building trust, cross-party relationships. And hybrid working can complement that, but it will never replace the actual ability to look somebody in the eye and see how things are going. Now, another way I think that the Parliament can improve the system is by allowing proxy voting. And there's been a lot of talk about this. And I would probably just concur by saying, as an ex-member of a WHIPS team, it is not the place of the WHIPS to hold the proxy vote. The proxy vote should be held by somebody the person who gives it to believes will represent their views. Yeah, yeah. One of the issues we failed to address, I believe, is the, the issue of how parliamentary business is carried out. I believe the domination of parliamentary business by the Bureau is not satisfactory. And I would ask those members present, have you ever been to a Bureau meeting? Because you can go if you want to, you have to ask permission and get approval from the WIPs, but you ought to go. You ought to see whether it's as edifying as you think it might be or might not be. <laughs> My other big bugbear is that members come to this chamber, and we haven't discussed this, with prepared speeches along party lines with patsy questions. I don't believe that also that many members are prepared to take interventions and engage. Debate is about just that, debating issues and having a formed discussion. And I think it's really important, and I think this parliament needs to mature to allow that to happen. Of course I'll give way. I, I thought I might take up some... Daniel uh, Johnson, uh, briefly. ...invitation. Uh, uh, do, does he think that members should at the very least reflect previous speakers in their contributions when they're making rather than just reading out speeches? Of course. And Mr it's Johnson mentioned. won't be surprised that I now come to doing that. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure my deputy convener will do exactly that. I agreed with my convener that we should be looking forward to 10 years France. And I agree with the minister that it shouldn't be the government that dictates the way that yeah. parliament changes. And I agree also uh, with Mr Kerr that parliament should make the changes and agree the changes in the what uh, they want to see. And I'm delighted to hear from Jackson Carlaw that he is progressive and open to change and that he did have actually quite a lot to say, despite the fact at the beginning he thought he wouldn't. Now, there's one area that I would just like to uh, drift on, if and, you could and that, do that is Katie Clark. Very Cla briefly, Mr. Mountain. Very briefly, if I may. Katie Clark, uh, the, the issue of decision time, and I think it's something that we need to discuss, because I do believe that limiting debate to a set time is wrong, and it might be that decision time is carried forward uh, to the next day rather than doing it later. That might be something worth considering. So, presiding officer, in, in summary, I think the Parliament needed to evolve, and it has evolved, and we need to go further, and we need to make our IT work for parliamentarians. But our IT can never replace this Parliament, and we should never lose sight of the fact that the best way we're going to work together on work as a Parliament and work as parties, which we may have different ideas, is by sitting down talking to us, trying to find consensus, and realising that we don't have a monopoly of good ideas. Thank you. Thank you. I call on George Adam, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, uh, you and I meet up on a regular occasion, as you do with all business managers uh, in the Parliament, and uh, you've mentioned to us all how you want open debates where people intervene and we are full of ideas and push things forward. And I feel today is probably an example. So having seen you earlier on today, I feel I've delivered exactly what you wanted, uh, presiding officer, to have a debate full of ideas, not always agreeing with one another, but ensuring that we can actually take things forward. 
Yes. Martin Whitfield. Uh, I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for the Minister giving way. And isn't it interesting that we saw an example of a remote contribution where a member in the Chamber sought to intervene, unfortunately unable to because of technology, but no one seemed to bat her eyelid and actually the flow of debate did carry on? Minister. Yes, and indeed, uh, I look forward to the technology being available to us where that can actually happen and we can have that debate and that intervention, uh, that said intervention as well, because it does make a difference for the debate. I'm also... When, uh, OK, I've got hundreds to say here, but no problem, Mr Kerr. I just, Stephen Kerr. I just think the debate has been a good example. And the idea, for example, that's been put forward in relation to the problem around decision time of deferred divisions, I think it's a cracking idea. Does the Minister agree? Minister. It's a decision time, it's in my notes, and if I can get myself to there, we'll get to that point. Uh, so, uh, basically, I understand uh, some of the, the criticism of the technology, because as I said before, we, I was in Bureau, where we effectively went for, there is a major worldwide pandemic happening, Parliament has shut up shop, we need to do something about it. And what happened with the parliamentary officials during that period was quite short of, not short of, remarkable of how we got a system. Yes, did it have problems? Was it difficult at times? Yes, it was. But it gave us an opportunity, as I said in my opening speech, to still have government scrutinised for the Parliament to continue at a very important time for the people of Scotland that Parliament was still being able to do uh, and uh, do what it has to do. But basically, the operational adaptions developed and adopted by the Parliament in light of COVID have been essential towards maintaining a good governance of Scotland. And I welcome the Committee's view that the Parliament should maintain the flexibility to enable hybrid and virtual proceedings. Uh, a principle very much supported by the Scottish Government and one which will no doubt be important in helping respond both quickly and effectively in the future. The finding of the Committee's report that despite recent events the Parliament was able to fulfil that scrutiny are especially welcome to the Government. If I can talk about some of the contributions we had here today as well, Martin Whitfield, the convener, uh, spoke about the fact that uh, how in 10 years in the future, how we will deal with uh, things in the Parliament. I think we do have to challenge ourselves that way because we don't want to be in a position, regardless of what happens in the future, of having to go from a standing start and uh, develop new ways of working. And I think we need to, we've seen that the technology works and we need to find other ways of making it better. But the technology itself, as we have all experienced from the technology that should have been starting just now, with the, the ability to intervene, hasn't, it has to be in place and it has to be robust for us to do it. So a lot of the time we have to make sure that the technology is uh, working with us. And Mr Mountain brought that up in particular because uh, he has been a critic at times where he has been from a, a rural location. He was unable to attend for six months and uh, he had to rely on that and it was quite difficult as well. Daniel Johnson brought up an um, important part when he talked about uh, the need for the maximum amount of time for face-to-face. -face. Uh, and I know, having worked and sat next to uh, Mr Johnson in a committee, I know the reasons why Mr Johnson wants to do that. And you asked the question uh, during the debate, and I'm probably one of the few people that understood why, because it's exactly what Rhoda, Rankin, uh, Rhoda Grant said about the fact that, uh, you know, how you judge the feeling of what's happening in the room. And for yourself, that's even more so. Uh, to be able to make a contribution. And I, I understand why that can be difficult when we're not physically in the same room because we could all find ourselves, we, uh, we could all find ourselves, if we're all online, misjudging what we say and all of us going down a completely different place. So there needs to be a balance and we need to ensure that you, presiding officer, are not sitting there in that chair on your own with an empty chamber here because that's hardly a good look for the, uh, Scotland's parliament. But Katie Clark and uh, uh, Rhoda Grant brought up the fact that uh, decision times, and you know, in all honesty, and you'll be aware of this, I do try to try and keep them within certain bases, but there are certain challenges, certain challenges for me from a government perspective, but not always. The mm. challenges sometimes come mm. from others uh, mm. who possibly yes. can push things a certain yeah. way. Uh, but yes, I do want to see my grandchildren before they go into high school. So I do want uh, the, the family uh, friendly hours so that I can go back and spend time with them as well. Yep. Rhoda Grant. I, I, I understand that, that you understand to an extent. However, it must be terrifying for a parent sitting here watching the clock tick by and knowing that their child's childcare is finished and they may be standing outside in the rain on their own yeah. waiting for their parent to turn up. Yeah. And that must be really difficult for a parent. 
Minister. Totally appreciative of uh, that situation, and as I say, I do try to work uh, to that. Now, there's always the challenges from my perspective where we have a situation where, you know, we all know, because we've been here for many years, December's and uh, the June will always be end of legislation at stage threes, and times will be pushed there. But yes, we need to find a way that when we're doing in between these kind of busier times, we find a way that five o'clock or uh, the family friendly ideals, as you quite rightly mentioned, mentioned Ms Grant, of this place, I think Katie Clark did as well, uh, are important that we stick to that. And it's one of the points we continue to bring up. Uh, President Officer, this has been a very good debate. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed, uh, after you are kind of asking us for many weeks to have an idea, a debate full of ideas, and uh, these are ideas that the Scottish Government will listen to and take forward. Uh, of course, the Parliament authorities are the ones that make these decisions, and we will engage in whatever way we can to ensure that we can be constructive within that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I now call on Bob Doris to wind up the debate on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Uh, thank you very much, Kavina, and my thanks to all members for contributions this afternoon, just as parliamentarians did a few months ago in an earlier debate which kick-started a committee inquiry. Today's debate has been, in, has been valuable and has been informative. It demonstrates the commitment to, of the Standards Committee to have an ongoing dialogue with MSPs and wider society about how any reforms to working practice in this place may change. The committee heard from MSPs within focus group sessions and through its survey. It was clear that there was a spectrum of views, just as there has been in the Chamber this afternoon. Those ranged from those who wished to return completely to previous practices, there were some, and those who wished to embrace all the changes unquestionably immediately. The debate today has been much more nuanced, it has been much more balanced, I feel. Uh, on balance, MSPs and others we spoke to, with caveats and safeguards, of course, would wish to build upon the innovations of the last couple of years. Innovations necessitated by a global pandemic, but innovations which offer a great opportunity to further develop a modern and inclusive Scottish Parliament. Gradual, iterative, monitored, careful and considered, but changes are absolutely required. Inclusive in how we support those individuals and groups across Scotland and beyond who wish to offer evidence to our parliamentary committees or participate more generally with the life of this Parliament, the hybrid Parliament offers a wonderful opportunity in relation to that. Rhoda Grant, Paul McClellan, Alexander Shute, Millie McGillie Mackay and others <coughs> spoke warmly about the opportunity for witnesses to be involved. I would say from today's debate and from the surveys we had, that is pretty much a bolt on, presiding officer, for a way forward in relation to committees, but also inclusive to those who are watching Parliament today, who would consider standing for election but perhaps think there are too many hurdles to overcome and are deterred from standing for election in the first place, be that due to family circumstances, geography, health concerns or a variety of other barriers which may exist. Indeed, we heard from MSPs today, MSPs have left this place because it was not suitably family friendly, appointed by Rhoda Grant, Emma Roddick and Colette Stevenson, amongst others. The Scottish Parliament is at the forefront of embracing change and continuing to provide for hybrid meetings and virtual voting. Not as an everyday occurrence, of course. We still believe that face-to-face -face interactions have significant benefits and enduring benefits for parliamentarians. Rather, a hybrid parliament as a reasonable adjustment and embedded adjustment when circumstances dictate the exception not the rule. Daniel Johnson and Stephen Kerr were very strong in this point during their contributions. And I thought Rhoda Grant and Edward Mountain made really important points. We heard the committee as well about the informal chats, the ability to read a room within a debate, uh, the, the, the quiet corners where MSPs across all parties can, can have a discussion and just build up those relationships. That can't happen by a virtual parliament. We also heard, uh, I thought, from Rhoda Grant, Colette Stevenson, I think... Uh, uh, Rona Mackay also made this point that because we have a hybrid function, hybrid function should not mean that we do not make this parliament, the physical building, as accessible and family friendly as possible to all MSPs. We did hear there was a danger that by saying, well, you can go hybrid, means parliament has to stop being physically accessible to all and that must not be allowed to happen. And that was reflected in the contributions here this afternoon also. We have quite a lot about proxy Voting and just to remind Parliament, the intention is to propose a scheme for proxy voting in this place that will be piloted 
on a basis of a temporary rule change to standing orders. The committee recommended that a pilot should cover parental leave and illness. If the evaluation of the pilot, a pilot which we consulted upon before we embarked upon either, uh, is successful, would seek to propose a permanent rule change. But already this afternoon, that will not be straightforward. We've heard that already. What will the definition of an illness be? Who will have oversight in relation to that? One MSP said, will sick notes be required? Will whips be involved? Well, Stephen Kerr, Katie Clark, Edward Mountain and myself included, in my personal view, absolutely not would be my view in relation to that. And I think that was a, a, a broad swell of opinion amongst Parliament. We also heard from Gillian Mackay about should we extend that list to where proxy voting could be used, perhaps to bereavement leave? And that's hard to argue against, but that's not what the report said. But just intuitively, that feels hard to argue against. Um, I should point out um, that, of course, we will soon have the ability and the technology in this place for when there is a hybrid contribution to have that two-way interaction for interventions for those at home and those in this place to improve that flow of debate. And the technology in this place has also been modernised to facilitate more smooth voting and things like that. But what I would point out is, of course, it won't be perfect. We'll continue to have to work on it during that iterative process to make sure we improve the technology and we improve the working practices. Uh, we also have other things, if I can find my notes here, because there were things that weren't in the report, presiding officer, that I do want to give a mention to. We didn't look at the wider scrutiny role of Parliament. We didn't look at the role of social media that some people mentioned. We didn't look particularly at spontaneity within debates, and we didn't look at a, a variety of, of, of other matters, including when decision time should be. But I'm minded, during that first debate we had, presiding officer, Jackson Carlos suggested deferring decision time to other days. We've heard today from, I think, Stephen Kern and Edward Mountain, uh, that they would like to see decision time one night a week been longer to give certainty with the rest of weeks. I agree with all those three suggestions. The problem is it's three Conservatives, President Officer, that I'm agreeing with, but there we are. I'm speaking on behalf of, of the committee. Uh, but, in, but in finishing off, uh, I want to thank the clerks that I didn't do at the outset for their work and marshalling the views of MSPs. And I'm also conscious that most MSPs were not in this chamber for the start of this debate or for the bulk of this debate. Get involved in it. Get active. Scrutinise this debate. Have your say because our committee has to have a measured and balanced view which will garner the maximum support for changes that we want to bring forward. Not for MSPs, presiding officer, but for the people of Scotland who we all serve to make sure this parliament is accessible and does its core job of representing the people of Scotland in a modern, accessible and accountable way. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on future parliamentary procedures and practices. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motions 6034 on committee membership and 6035 on a committee substitute. And after all that excitement, presiding officer, back to usual, moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that motion 5983, in the name of Martin Whitfield, on behalf of the Standard, Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, on future parliamentary procedures and practices be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And I propose to ask a single question on two parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? No member objects. Therefore, the final question is that motions 6034 on committee membership and 6035 on a committee substitute um, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time and we'll now move on to members' business.